That's a good song. That is a good song. Somebody say amen. Bind my heart. Seal my heart. I have a heart, like everybody else, wants to wander astray. Amen to that. And I don't want to do that. When I, when I got saved, nine years old, at Camp Niangua, 19, 1975 is when I got saved. And I didn't get saved because I loved the Bible. I didn't get saved because I fell in love with Jesus. I didn't get saved because I wanted to preach the gospel everywhere. I got saved because I didn't want to die and go to hell. And now, some 40 some odd years later, I still don't want to go to hell. Amen? I don't want to go. So that's why God seals us. And you've heard me say this over and over. When things are going well in your life, that's the time that you say, God, I like it, I'm enjoying it, I love it, but I know it's not going to last. So God, when I'm down in the valley, you be the same God for me in the valley that you are for me up on the mountain. Amen? Amen to that. Well, it's good to be here tonight. And uh, so, so far... I'm just checking, has our, is our audio working pretty good? Anybody want to fill me in on that? Let me know. Uh, we've got another computer on the way. Because I figured, buy another computer and try it. So it's on the way here. But if what I did fixed our problem, then we'll just keep that computer on the sidelines and have it in case... In case of emergency. That way we'll, we'll still be able to stream. Um, the, the blessing that God has given this church is the fact that we can reach beyond the four walls of this building. And we are. Uh, we had a visitor Sunday morning, blessed my heart. Because I mean, I was low Sunday morning. You guys know. And I went back and shook her hand. She told me her name and, and I said, well, I'm glad you're here. Make yourself at home. And, you know, sometimes people just come into a church. They don't, they're just trying out a church. And I didn't know if she had been seeing things on the internet we had done or not. But she brought it up and she said, I've been watching your videos. I'm trying to watch every one you've done. I said, good luck to that. And, uh, I could, I could tell the emotion in her voice. And I said to her, I said, God sent you here to be a blessing to me. And if, I, if I'm right, she was one of the ones that prayed uh, while we were down here at the altar. I, didn't, I wasn't looking at anybody, but I heard her say that, you know, she thanked God for allowing her to see our videos online. So I appreciate that. John gave his testimony uh, that... I was the last thing on his mind to watch. And John, I don't understand that, John. I mean, come on. You should have picked me first. But he watched something. What was it? Do you remember? The one. That one, right? That one. Mother of all secrets? Mother of all secrets, yep. Yeah. Okay, and you just never know what reaches people. So I'm thankful. I praise the Lord and uh, thank you for you guys that are here tonight and all you folks with us online. Um, let's take our Bible. Let's turn to Second Peter and um, let's study the Word of God tonight. We're gonna, we're studying the Word of God and what the Word of God says about the Word of God. Because the only proper place to get our doctrine from on, let's say, salvation. Our doctrine of salvation comes from the words that are in this book. This is how we learned how we are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. 
Uh, by the way, Brian's out there. He's got the lights out in the foyer. He asked me if he could do that. And I said, yeah, it's so that he can see in the parking lot better. And I want, I, I want people to know that if you come in here aiming to shoot somebody, we will shoot you. Okay? I hate the fact that I have to carry a gun. Okay? I hate that. And I hope to never use it. Okay? But if I have to, to protect my wife, what was it, Brian? God saved the flock using a Glock? <laughs> Something like that? Uh, that guy in that video was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. And that man saved a lot of people's lives. And uh, I, I hate it, but this is the world we live in, all right? So we get our doctrine about salvation from the Bible. We get our doctrine about heaven from the Bible. We get our doctrine about hell from the Bible. We get our doctrine about God from the Bible, about Jesus from the Bible, about the Holy Spirit from the Bible. We get all these doctrines from the Bible. The most important doctrines from the Bible is concerning the Bible itself. What should we believe about the Bible? So I had um, a guy that uh, he came and visited here a while back. He texted me and he said that his, his he, I mean, he believes in King James, but his wife reads these modern translations. And he said, she read, and you don't, it's hard to find this anymore, but in the older King James Bibles, there's a, there's a probably about a four or five page letter in these Bibles, written by the translators to the reader of the Bible. It's called the Epistle to the Readers. And in that letter, they wrote and they said, in a, in a very humbly, they said, we, by the grace of God, we did our best to translate this Bible as correctly as we possibly could. But we're, we're not positive that we got everything exactly right. We're not sure. So this woman used that as evidence against her husband to say not even the translators believed that that Bible was perfect. And so he asked me that question. How do I answer that? I said, answer it with scripture. Let God be true and every man a liar. If, if a man says, we're not sure if every word in this Bible is right, and yet God in this Bible says that every word in the Bible is right, who do you listen to? You listen to man or do you listen to God? You listen to God. Let God be true and every man a liar. So they were being humble. They weren't sure. But I am absolutely 100% convinced that every word of God still is pure. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 15. Moreover. I always wanted to have a dog and call him moreover. Because Lazarus had one. Moreover, the dog came and licked his sores. Right? That's what it says. All right. Moreover, I will endeavor. I'll quit telling jokes. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Again, this is why we have the word of God written down. So that after Peter is gone, we still have Peter. After Paul dies, we still have Paul. John died. We still have what John said. Moses is dead. We still have the words of Moses. So that after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter's again, he's recounting what he saw, what he heard on that day. He heard the voice of God. That would freak me out. If I heard God's voice saying, this is my beloved son. But he heard it. And he said, verse 18, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But we have also a more sure word of prophecy. 
Where until you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, let, let me throw something in here for a minute. The Catholic Church says that the popes that they have put in office continue the office of Peter the Apostle. In other words, Peter, according to them, was the first pope. And then after Peter, some other guy, and after that guy died, some other guy, and some other guy, and some other guy. Now we have Francis the talking pope. Okay? And they want you to believe that God is speaking through these men who they say follow in the line of Peter. And Peter's dead. Peter's dead, so the Catholic Church wants you to believe that the men who they put in the place of Peter are saying what God wants you to hear. But what they're saying goes against what is written in this book. So again, you can either follow these popes, child molesters, sodomites, and all kinds of drunkards, whoremongers, murderers. I mean, we have a whole list of men who were very evil, wicked men, who they said, we're the voice of God. We, in fact, they called themselves the vicar of God. You know what that means? They stand in the place of Jesus Christ. That they have the authority of Jesus Christ. So you can believe that, or you can believe the Bible. But you can't believe both of them. You got to pick one. Okay, and that's what he's saying. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. That's at the coming of Christ. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when Moses wrote down, the words, they were not Moses' words, they were God's words given to Moses, and Moses wrote them down. So did Isaiah, so did Jeremiah, so did Ezekiel, so did John, so did Peter, so did James, so did Paul. All of these men, so did Solomon and David, all of these men, God put the words Gave it to them, they wrote it down, and as we're going to see, those words are pure, and they have remained pure all this time. Now, we, we didn't have service last Wednesday night, uh, because of, it was Christmas, so it's been a while, but we were studying the phrase, the Word of God, and what the Word of God says about the Word of God. So we'll start here, um, Romans chapter 10, you can follow with me or you can read up on the screen. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what this teaches is that our sole source of faith, what we believe and what we are supposed to believe, comes only by the word of God. If I say something that is contrary or contradicts what's in your Bible, you are to believe your Bible instead of me. I can be wrong. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. So the Bible is our only source of faith. Amen? Not the Bible plus the Pope. Not the Bible plus the Book of Mormon. Not the Bible plus uh, Ellen White's writings. Not the Bible plus any latter day prophets who say that they're hearing messages from God or they're dreaming dreams or whatever. Not the Bible plus them. Only the Bible. That's the sole source of faith. It is our sanctification. First Timothy 4, 5. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And what that's talking about is the things that we eat. And somebody uh, asked me the other day about eating pork. And I said, you know, it, it, if you don't want to eat pork, you've got good reasons to not eat pork. They are nasty, filthy, dirty, disgusting animals. But boy, they taste good. <laughs> so how is it 
that we can eat pork because God said it was unclean. Here he doesn't change the law. He cleans what was unclean. Now you take that and apply that to yourself. You're the pig. You're the pig. You're the one that's unclean and God cleans you and sanctifies you by the word of God. It's unbound. 2 Timothy 2, nine. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. The word of God can go into places where people don't want the word of God. Sister Hyun Mi, can you own a Bible in North Korea? No. What will happen if they find you with a Bible in North Korea? Huh? They'll kill you. And yet, there are people with Bibles in North Korea. God finds a way. There's a story. I learned it as a young man. There was some, a company that made some Christian comic books. And one of them was about a man by the name of Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew spent his life, he was a, I can't remember what country is from, European, one of these European countries, but he spent his life smuggling Bibles in behind the Iron Curtain, the communist nations. And he was hiding them in different places in his car to where they couldn't find him. And he had so many requests for Bibles that one day he filled his entire car, back seat, trunk, front seat, front floorboard, had Bibles all, and he comes up to a checkpoint. And the guys at the checkpoint, they know who he is. And they say, we know this guy's smuggling Bibles. And they're looking all through his car. And you know what? They couldn't find the Bibles. They couldn't see the Bibles. And they were, and they were all over the place. They said, we know you got Bibles. Where are they? I don't know. Look for yourself. They couldn't see the Bible. God wouldn't let them see the Bibles. And the man drove through and distributed the Bibles. See, I believe stuff like that. I believe the Bible is unbound. The Bible does not need your assistance to do what God wants it to do. Somebody say amen. The Bible is effectual. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. Who in here has heard this before? Has heard somebody say the Bible was written by men. You've heard people say that, haven't you? Oh, the Bible was written by men. But what does that say? You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And I covered this two weeks ago because I, I showed you about how DNA and I'm not going to go back through this again tonight, but I showed you about how DNA works in your, in your body. There isn't anything in your conscious mind that makes your fingers grow, your hair grow. Jesus told us which of you, just by thinking about it, could add one cubit to your stature. Who can do that? Nobody can. Some of you wish that you were thinner than you are. But you're not. You can't just think, I want to be thin, and then all of a sudden you're thin. Your DNA does what your DNA is supposed to do, and it does it without your assistance or your help. And that's the Word of God. And I say this, if you will believe the Word of God, the Word of God will do what the Word of God is supposed to do. But if you don't believe the Word of God, then it's as nothing to you. My, my favorite uh, reader of the Bible, Alexander Scorby, I have those recordings, Sterling has them, he plays them. Every time he turns his truck on, he's got a CD with Alexander Scorby reading the King James Bible. That man read the entire Bible, didn't believe a word of it. Isaac Asimov, you know who that is? Who is he? 
Isaac Asimov. Does anybody know? Science fiction writer. You know, he wrote a commentary on the Bible. And he's an atheist. He didn't believe it. But he writes a commentary on the Bible, which means he read the whole Bible and wrote a commentary about how basically all of it's wrong. He didn't believe a word of it. And he died in that condition. He didn't believe it. It doesn't work if you don't believe it. But the word of God is alive and powerful. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick, which means alive. The word of God is alive. Think of your DNA. Your DNA is alive. And your DNA is doing right now everything that your DNA is supposed to do in your body. Your DNA is keeping your blood supply up. Your DNA is, is causing the food that you eat to be uh, converted into sugar, which goes into the cells, and the cells burn it in the mitochondria, and that gives fuel and heat and energy, and that's what's causing you to live. And all of these things are happening because the Word of God is alive. And when the Word of God is spoken to something that is dead, it comes to life. Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth. So the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Who knows from the book of Proverbs, who has a two-edged sword? And I, I, won't say, I won't say no more. There's somebody in the book of Proverbs and their words are a two-edged sword. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? The strange woman. If you read the book of Proverbs, there's two women in there. There's the pure woman, the godly woman, wisdom. And then there's the harlot woman, the strange woman. And her tongue is a two-edged sword. You know what that kind of means? It means that she speaks, we, we use this phrase, we, he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. And what does that mean? He's saying one thing to one person, but he's saying something else to another person. He's saying, yes, he believes this, but he tells others, no, I don't believe that. That's that two-edged sword. And that's why your Bible says that the Bible is sharper. So her weapon against you can kill you unless your weapon against her her is sharper than her weapon. Does that make sense? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Anytime Jesus was with groups of people, the Bible said Jesus discerned their thoughts. Here's Jesus and he's teaching and he's got a bunch of Pharisees there and and they're, they're trying to think in their mind how they can trip Jesus up. Or they're trying to think in their mind about how wrong Jesus is. And Jesus knows what they're thinking. How many of you have ever read the Bible and said, God, that is exactly what I was thinking about today. Or a preacher preached a sermon. And the sermon was, you're going... Pastor Mike, why were you preaching about me? I wasn't. Okay. But it was the word of God piercing down into your heart and showing you things that are not. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Your intentions matter. You can go to church all your life and go to hell. If your intentions are wrong. Blessed are the pure in heart, the Bible says. 1 John 2, 14. The word of God abides in us. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Young men. Listen, young men. In this world, Without the word of God abiding in you, 
you will never have power over the wicked one. In this world, this world is bad. And it's getting worse. Amen? The Word of God is good. Hebrews 6, 5, And have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the world to come. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What, what is, by the way, let me ask you this. What does the Bible taste like? Milk and honey. When the manna came down from heaven, they ate the manna and they said, that tastes sweet like honey. And incidentally, your DNA is made of sugar. Your DNA, the book that God wrote with all the instructions for your body, is made out of phosphorus and sugar. So that you really are a sweet person. Amen? Okay. The Word of God, Hebrews 11, has creative... And, and I'm going to spend a little time on this. Joyce Myers, Kenneth Copeland, all these other names. I told you I bought some Joyce Myers books from the Goodwill store. And I started going through them one day. And I can see her witchcraft in it because I know what to look for. And she teaches that you have creative power with your words. That if you believed strongly enough, you could say, I want a brand new car right there, right now. And a brand new car would show up right there and right now. That's witchcraft, by the way. When the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar, it means that. Your words have no, can do nothing for you except get you in a lot of trouble. But the word of God, Hebrews 11:3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What does that mean? It means that everything that we have here Everything that is around us, everything that exists was made by the word of God. But what was it made of? Nothing. Have you ever seen a 3D printer work? It's pretty cool because you can insert this little software code. And this 3D printer can print out some sort of object that you need. Uh, Donna, who wrote our Pure Bible Search software, made for me a 3D printed model of DNA. And it's pretty cool. Okay? But that DNA, that printer had to have material injected in it, and then it was formed out of the material that was injected in it. When God created the heavens and the earth, He created them out of absolutely nothing. So everything really is made. You could use the word matrix. The word matrix is the, like the word frame. And that's what that verse says. That, um, where was that? Hebrews 11, 3 through 3. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God, they didn't exist. God spoke it and now it exists. And that's the power that God's word has. Now the devil wants that power. But he doesn't have it. He can only change the form of something, I believe. But he cannot make something out of nothing. He doesn't have that power. Only the word of God does. So, here's, here's what I would say to you. If there is something in your life that you feel is lacking. Let's say that you have a you have a hard time with believing everything in the Bible. You struggle with it. The best thing to do 
is to read the Bible. And God will form in you the faith that you didn't have before and now you have it. I know this for a fact because that is exactly what happened to me one day, 19... I want to say it was 1998, sitting in my office, and I had read some scripture, and I was thinking about those things, and the Lord said, Mike, that Bible is right. Every word of it's right. And God instantly created in me an instantaneous belief that every word in this book was right. And he created it out of nothing. And it's been there all this time. 1998, that was what, 22 years ago. This is 2020, 98. Am I right? Yeah, 22 years ago. So 22 years, God has still instilled in my heart that every word in this book is right. And that just came out of nowhere. And God did that for me. So I was lacking in faith, and God put it in me by His Word. God put it in me by His Word, and then He began to build upon that foundation with His Word. So if you're lacking in faith, the Word of God can give it to you. If some of you are lacking in an area of life that has to do with sin, or your resistance against sin, God through His Word, can create in you a resistance to sin that you never had before. Say amen to that. Drunkards, put the bottle down. Dope addicts, stay away from the drugs. And they just come to a place where they just say, you know what, I don't want it anymore. Where did that come from? The Word of God created it in your life out of nothing. And now all of a sudden, you're different. You're a changed person because of the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the Word of God, here, this is another verse that goes along with that, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. How did, uh, go to Genesis 1 very quickly. I made this point before, but in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form. Verse 3, God said, let there be light and there was light. Where did the light come from? The light didn't come from anywhere, but God created it. And how did he create it? He spoke it. So people ask me all the time, Pastor, how can I get... Uh, some people ask me, Pastor, how can I convince my pastor to stop using modern translations to go with the King James? And I tell them, you can't. You can't. What has to happen is, God has to say to them, let there be light. And when God does that, like He did with me, there's light. Where did it come from? Nowhere. God created it by His Word. So why do we see such destruction happening in churches all over the country, all over the world? Because the Bible isn't there anymore. And the destroyer is. The Word of God has creative power. And don't let the modern day witches and wizards and warlocks of the charismatic word faith movement tell you that you speak creative words of power and they will come to pass in your life. You can create your own wealth or you create your own sickness. They will say... If you say, if somebody asks you, how are you feeling today? Man, I'm sick today. According to them, you just spoke sickness into your body. And now, of course, you're sick because you spoke it into your body. 
No, what you were doing was telling the truth. And what they want to teach you is, they want to tell you to lie. How are you feeling today? I feel great in Jesus' name. <laughs> You're lying. They're telling you to lie through your teeth. And then God is going to bless you? I don't think so. Amen? Revelation 6, turn there. The Bible is worth dying for. Now, young people, listen to me for a second, okay? Because I remember sitting where you guys are sitting. And I remember hearing sermons preached about the second coming of Christ and about how it was going to be, it was going to be imminent. In other words, we're talking in the late 70s, early 80s, there were preachers who were preaching, man, it, it can't get any worse than it is out there. And I believe Jesus is going to come back real soon. And, and all kinds of terrible things are going to happen. And I can remember being a young man singing in the pew going, Well, that's, I don't want that. That's scary. I even remember one preacher saying, he, he heard a rumor. And he passed along a rumor that somebody... I can't remember what, what it was, but they got some, something in the mail about their Social Security. Instead of getting their Social Security check, they got the Social Security letter saying that their check will come as soon as they get the 666 mark. And so they take it to the Social Security office and the Social Security office tells them, oh, that was a mistake. This is not supposed to go out until 1982. That was preached from this pulpit. I remember it. I'm not going to say who preached it. Obviously, it was before 1982. And I'm going, I'm not going to get to graduate. I'm not going to get to ma get married. I was bummed out. But let me tell you something. Death is going to happen to all of us. All of us are appointed to die. I want to die doing something for Jesus. So Revelation 6, verse 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And for the testimony which they held. The Bible's telling you that some people are going to be killed because they won't give up their Bible. You know, I hid a Bible, Todd. When I was in fifth grade, the Gideons could come, that was back when the Gideons could go to public schools and hand out Bibles. And I remember getting one of those Bibles and I found a place up in, the, up in the attic above my bedroom under the insulation and I stuck a Bible under there because I'm going, if they come here getting our Bibles, they won't know about that one. And I'll still have one. I was a kid. I was a kid. But I knew that Bible was important. And I knew people hated it. And they won't try to get rid of it. And Hyun Mi's telling the truth. If you're in North Korea and you have a Bible, they will kill you. They'll kill your family. Because the Word of God makes people free. And the Word of God is worth dying for. Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. They got their head cut off. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. 
Now, if you gave me a choice, having my head cut off would be probably quick, painless death. So, if I get a choice, I'll choose that one. Okay? But I don't get a choice. But you see, there's people coming in churches now shooting people. So this is why we have to have a guy out in the lobby every service now to make sure nobody comes in here. By the way, we're going to have one Sunday where we're going to have a little drill. We're going to practice what happens if somebody comes in shooting. We have to do it. That latest church shooting, what was it, six seconds? Six seconds. That's all it was. And that guy that jumped up, pulled his gun out, and shot that guy, that guy's a hero as far as I'm concerned. He saved a lot of people's lives. There's a young lady. Who, do you remember the, um, the Columbine High School shooting? You remember that? The two guys that did the shooting, do you know who they were looking for? They were looking for Christians. And, there was, and they know this. There was a young lady by the name of Cassie. And those two devil-infested men, boys, asked her, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And she said, yes. Bam! I believe she's in heaven. Now listen, that's scary stuff. When I was your age, I didn't want to hear that stuff. So I'm not trying to scare you. But what I want to say to you is, everybody is going to die of something. Everybody is. I would rather die for my Lord. Because He died for me. Amen? This Bible, and when I say this Bible, you know what Bible I'm talking about. This Bible is worth dying for as far as I'm concerned. I will live by it, and by God's grace, I will die by it. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't mind dying while I was reading it. I wouldn't mind. It's worth it. Now, Mark seven thirteen. The word of God can be rendered non-effective. You know what that means? It can be to where it doesn't work. Mark Mark seven thirteen. Jesus said, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. And Jesus was talking to the Jews. The Jews had the word of God given to Moses and given to the prophets, right? But you know what they did? They wrote other books that basically had higher authority than the word of God. And they literally made the word of God of no effect. Jesus went to his own people and preached to them for three and a half years. And they hated him. I mean, we're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. On this earth, preaching to people. And they hated him. And he was a Jew just like them. And he preached to them. And the, did you know the Bible said that he had to leave certain towns because he could do no miracles there because of their unbelief. I want you to think about this. The King of kings and Lord of lords who can speak life into a dead, rotting corpse. He can speak life into it. And yet he's in a place where he can't do miracles because they don't believe. And let me tell you this. 1997, 
November was when God said to me, Mike, we're going to study prophecy. And what I did was I said, God, I'll do it, but help me throw out everything that I think that I already know. Help me throw out and forget things I've been taught and then you teach them to me. Because I could say something about the rapture to you and you, and you say, I already know all about the rapture, I don't want to hear that. But maybe there's something that you're wrong about concerning the rapture. Maybe there's something you're wrong about concerning the beast or the mark of the beast or the number. Maybe there's something you're wrong about and what happens is we have our tradition that we've heard from other people. And in fact, I'll just, I, I do this all the time. I, I will ask you right now, can you show me, can you show me in the Bible a seven year tribulation period? Can you show it to me in the Bible? Show it to me. That's one of those things that people have, men have developed. They've embedded it in people's minds. And then all of a sudden everybody believes it. But when you ask them, show it to me in the Bible, they can't show it to you in the Bible. That's what I mean. You've made the word of God of none effect by your tradition. Somebody asked me Sunday morning about the Lutheran church. They knew some people that were Lutherans. And they said, she, she said, they believe this and this and this and this. And she said, is that in the Bible? I said, no, it's not anywhere in the Bible. She said, why do they believe that? I said, I don't know. You tell me. They believe it because their church tradition told them to believe it. And they believed it. And part of it was the Lutheran church will tell you if you memorize the catechism and say and answer all the questions correctly and become a member of the church, you are automatically going to heaven. Now, where is that in the Bible? Doesn't exist. But that's what they believe. They've made the word of God of none effect by their tradition. And the word of God has been, 2 Corinthians 2, it's been altered. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So when, when I was young, we never, we never saw this, never had to do it. When you handed cash money to a cashier, they just assumed that that was real money and they put it in the drawer. Nowadays, when you hand a cashier a $20 bill, what are they going to do with it? Why? Because there's a bunch of fakes out there. A bunch of fake money out there. And they're not going to take fake money. Are there fake Bibles? We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. My mind has been changed on several things because I actually read the Bible instead of just thinking that I knew what it said. And I did that with God. I said, God, throw out everything that I think I believe, and I want you to teach it to me right. Now, there's still a lot of things that I don't know about concerning Bible prophecy. I'm still learning. But I want to know it. I want to know it from here. And I want to be able to say it from here. Let me give you two more things and then we'll close. It can be lied about. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The word of God can be lied about. I can get up here and read that verse and I can say, Now, I went to the original Greek. The original Greek actually says, and I could give you something else that's not even in the Bible, and I could tell you that, and believe it or not, people would believe that. And what I've just done is I've just lied about 
God's word. And people will believe that. The word of God can be blasphemed. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not what? Blasphemed. Ladies, that verse is for you. Ladies. I believe ladies ought to act like ladies. Is that wrong for me to say? I believe ladies ought to be chaste. You know what that means? Pure. Pure in their mind. Pure in their lips. Pure in their actions. I believe ladies ought to be keepers at home. I believe ladies ought to be good. Obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Now that's not popular. But it's the word of God. I didn't write it. But I'm definitely not going to change it. I'm not here to judge anybody. But I'm here to tell you this is what the word of God says. God's word can be blasphemed. B shows up, you know what's written on him? Names or words of blasphemy. He blasphemes the word of God. What did Goliath do? He cursed the Israelites and he cursed God by his gods. He blasphemed God. They killed him for it. So yeah, the word of God's powerful. Unless you decide you're not going to believe it. And then it stinks to be you.